So these examples are from the Department of Justice's Community Resources Service. And this is the group that tends to go into communities after riots, large racial incidents, et cetera. I've worked with several of their trainers in the past. Um, and it is meant for de-escalating situations. I'm not gonna go through the entire PowerPoint, but as you can see, these are statements that block out and inhibit communication. And they tend to trigger people. Um, it's cutting off the bottom. The bottom, number eight, is I understand you people. Never ever say you people. And nine is will you ever learn? So for those who are blind like me, it's wait a minute at the beginning, hold on there. What you really mean is, what's your problem? That is a stupid thing to say. And I have to say name calling, calling people stupid, idiot, etc. That immediately just makes it all go sideways. You've got it all wrong, listen to me. So I'm trying to get it to go forward. There it goes. Now these are statements that they suggest when you're marshalling or you're working with protests that are better for getting people to calm down and talk to you. So talk to me, tell me more. How can I make this work for you? Please explain your concerns or feelings. I can understand how you feel about that. Let me see if I have understood you correctly. I really appreciate your help with this. Tell me what you want. Tell me what you think. So, come on, thank you. I actually hate this kind of stuff on a PowerPoint because you never know when you're doing it right. So one of the things is don't touch people. And I had to explain this to several of our people on campus because they always, the students want to go put arm around them. And that's the last thing. If somebody's upset, angry, already feeling disrespected, the arm around them is going to make them insane. And gender here makes it worse. If they are women and you're putting the arm around or you have the hand in the middle of the back, or dude's hand stays up. You know, the minute that hand is coming into this direction, we are getting upset. And you would not believe the number of gentlemen I've had to say, no. I know you had good intentions, you're trying to usher her through the door. If your hand is here, she has every reason to be mad at you. But for guys too, men don't want to be touched. So oftentimes we'll try to calm someone down by touching them, that only works if you have a relationship with them. So we're not gonna to touch them. Um, but you also wanna avoid being personal, making it sound like they have a personal problem. This is where y'all have heard the term gaslighting. Telling them that's not happening. I'm sorry you perceive that. Other people see it differently. I don't see what you're seeing. Does this make sense? I don't see what you're seeing. Can you explain why? So you want to be careful, especially about that body posture, because if you look like you're mad or you're too rigid, you're pushing out that chest, you look like you're, you're about to command people. And in the U.S., that means this much space. Someone who's inside of this, it feels aggressive. So respect, courtesy, and sincerity are ways of de-escalating. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to back up to that first set.
as we are looking at this first part. You see these questions here? I want you to take a set of five and to think of the one sentence responses that would bring the conversation back on track. So let's take about 10 to 15 minutes to do that. Okay, so we're gonna to start to debrief out. Um, I gave our two people here a little different assignment. They wrote down how they would respond to someone who is being a bad faith actor within this kind of, what, within this kind of framework on the front. What would they do out of the tactics we've been using? So do you want to debrief that? Turning the tables by getting your opponent angry, uh, my thought was to be present uh, to what was happening uh, using the breathing technique, techniques and loosening hands. Um, as far as uh, the uh, allegation that uh, taking things too personally is to make an effort to identify feelings, um, the uh, phrase about uh, never taking uh, what is being said seriously, uh, just saying uh, self-affirmation. That's what I've got. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I got. Because if, if someone is already like preparing themselves to be this way and to be ready for your comments and then have something to make you go off, um, is there really any point in trying to talk to a person like that? They're, they obviously have their minds closed already. Is anything that you say or do going to change their minds? Or is it a, an exercise in futility? It depends. You know, especially if we're talking about a boss or someone higher up in an institution or we're talking to politicians, you're trying to get them to do what you need to do. There's a benefit to being able to use these phrases because you're boxing them in and you're boxing them in in front of people and that's going to push them to at least try to find some sort of common ground with you. Does this make sense? Well, those are to keep you calm so you can deal with this on this side. Because this is what they're trying to do to you. So you need to have tactics here to breathe through, to think about it, so that you can remember to use your responses here. These, this is what, say, a troll but there are in-person trolls we have to deal with. If you're on a board, if you're on a committee, if you're testifying, city council, a panel, police and fire commission, this is their motivation. These are their tactics. Does that make sense? So you're gonna have to engage them anyway. And especially if you're engaging them in a small group, by being able to calmly respond, you're putting peer pressure on them to respond in that manner. You're not allowing them to control the narrative. And in our culture, the narrative is what's important. Does that make sense? So I'm, we're teaching you to take back control of the narrative. When I had to testify um, before the Wisconsin Senate about a bill on black hair braiding, there was a black senator who was using some of these tactics on me because she represented the people who use hair relaxers, who are beauticians. She wanted to keep the braiders to have to get beauticians licenses 
because that's a barrier to entry. They saw them as a problem. But up here, if you have a biracial child, there are no black beauticians. You need hair braiders. There are some white hairdressers who will try to relax those children's heads. And I have seen the third degree burns. I also have had third degree grown burns on my head um, from a bad relaxer. That's why I'm natural now. This is just flat iron. The, you know, it's an illusion perpetrated by the man. This is not what my hair normally looks like. So I had to become, despite the provocation, my audience was her, but my audience was also the other people in the room. And the other people on the committee voted the bill out of the Senate committee, and it passed three weeks ago. So I was the expert, I was the expert witness that was for that. So if I had let this one person who was coming at me, if I had let her make me angry, if I had let her get me off message, if I had let her derail it, I wouldn't have been able to get my point across, which is that up here, we need the braiders, and there's no good reason to force them to get a full beautician's license when they're not dealing with chemicals. Now, she insulted me. She called me a black radical. <laughs> she insulted my hair. No, well, she meant it to be. It was a passive-aggressive insult. <laughs> she, she was doing her best to go through the list. So the things I'm telling you are not, it's not just from the research, it's not just that these are things that I actually have had to use and been able to use. She was not going to be reachable, but everybody around her was. So does that make sense? And if you can be calm, then you can reach the ones who are reachable. Or if you're calm, you don't put the mashed potatoes upside Uncle JoJo's head. And that may be the most important part of this exercise. So let's finish over here. Well, the other couple things that I've thought of um, uh, with somebody saying they've had the same experience would be to ask them how they felt about that occurrence uh, to them. And then um, in response to the demand for evidence and proof uh, would be the question about, well, how did you come to believe what you believe? And why do I have to provide proof when you don't? If you made this assertion that there is none, why are you saying that? Now, if they're just being obnoxious, I will say Google's your friend. How does that, how does that uh, keep you from getting into the mire of um, recitation of statistics and, and this and that? I mean, I, I've received a lot of that on the county board. Um, emails that are pages long with all these arguments and uh, research that, that those people have done. Uh, how do you circumvent getting into that kind of comparison and net picking and um, allegations? Well, this is not valid research and mine is. Well, you know, I work in academia. <laughs> I get those people all the time. I am a good one for slapping a site on or slapping a link on it and say, you should read this. And it's always a peer-reviewed article or something like that. Um, but if they're demanding, 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 I will point out, you are making a claim. Where's your research? You want me to do all this, but you haven't proven your claim at all. So I will sometimes double back and make them do the research, which undermines the argument. If I've already proven the claim and they go, I don't like this and I don't like that, uh, uh, no. I have a site, you don't. We are not gonna play citation police today. Especially not with an interdisciplinary historian who works with statistics. You either put up a site or you shut up. 
And, and sometimes you have to be that direct. Because I did, I was also on the University Senate Committee for the LE, and we had one person, again, I will not say the name of the guilty, but a lot of people at university know who the guilty is. <laughs> and uh, he did a lot of, we'll prove this, prove that, prove this. He got one email from me with multiple citations. Well, I don't like those citations. Well, that's too bad. You know, you're either going to put something else up that refutes it, but you don't get to police me. You are not the authority here. You are not the one in control here. There are other people on this panel, and you are wasting our time. Does that make sense? Because sometimes you just have to, well, I can do that with other PhDs, because we're used to kind of blunt forcing each other. <laughs> Um, some of them you might have to be nicer, but it's, I've given you the research you want to see. You haven't done anything to prove your point. We're moving on. I think it, we can still get into the situation of my research is valid, your research isn't, because I get plenty of emails that have all these kind of links, and I start to read and my eyes glaze over, and it's, it's like, how do you follow that kind of uh, train of thought, it's like going down a rabbit hole. Well, you know, if they want to say my research is valid and yours is not, there's this really great website called Your Logical Fallacy. And if people really annoy me, they get slapped with a logical fallacy card. Um, this, the best the one, though, is the logical fallacy ref. Because then it's a football ref, and they're calling on the play. And it's like, Answer is, you know, you're questioning the other person's evidence, and they say the name of the fallacy, five yards, or thrown off the field. And it's funny, but it stops them. There's also, and I have to remember, I'll send it to Mark so Mark can send it out to y'all. There's, um, from Media Matters, there's a chart, and it's of where certain newspapers and things hit on from left to right, valid to unvalid, to lacking validity. So you can always send that chart back, and I've done that to people who said, I saw this YouTube video, and they said... Now, the part of me that wants to go, okay, I have a PhD in history, and you saw Joe Blow on, on YouTube, really? But I have to refrain, send them the chart. People on YouTube with no credentials and no way to back them up are not going to be evidence. Every once in a while, I have to give them a list of what evidence is and what evidence isn't that I pulled from Harvard, and I dare them to fight with that. Because if you want to fight with Alan Dershowitz, that's on you. <laughs> you know? But sometimes, so I have this sort of package of things that I can just pull off of my computer and slap on that so that I don't have to waste a lot of my time engaging in this back and forth nitpicking that's meant to just waste and irritate and tire me out. Does that make sense? But the your logical fallacy ref is wonderful. Salika, can I add to that? Um, your logical fallacy ref. You know, if you just Google logical fallacy ref or your logical fallacy, these sites come up. And there is a free um, poster you can get, which has a list of all the logical fallacies. For in my classroom, I have a deck of cards, and if a student asks a loaded question, they get a card thrown out. <laughs> and that's good for kids, you know, so if they want to ask me a question that, that in, in history, we, in, in the legal profession, we call some of these questions, have you stopped beating your wife yet? Have you stopped beating your children yet? There is an assumption within the question. They get that card. Rephrase that question. Because sometimes that's how people are trying to catch you, too. But yeah, you want to be prepared for this so you don't waste your time. Yeah, absolutely. You, you kind of <laughs> taken away what I wanted to say. Sorry. That's OK. That's OK, because it sets it up nicely. So. Let me ask you all a question. 
when you think about the nature and context of social media, so when we think about the context and nature of social media, right, and all the discordant conversations that occur in social media, right, some of the conversations are just downright vicious. Right? What do we find to be a common trait in those conversations? Think about that for a second. What do we find to be a common trait in all of these just dyspeptic conversations? Some just downright vile. Up. So it distracts from the main topic. Other comments. Self-centeredness. Discounts the person. Okay. Any other comments? A non-anonymity. So they are, sometimes they make comments that are just pernicious but yet they try to maintain their anonymity, right? They don't want people to know who actually said it, right? It's oftentimes done on a, a fake identifier, right? Right, so a lot of times it's just, you know, you're, you're, you're interacting with the screen, right, which creates this, aura of dehuman, dehumanization, right? So what you read oftentimes doesn't necessarily denote or, de or identify as a real person, right? The screen kind of functions as that. What are some other things when we think about some common traits or characteristics of these vile conversations? that might occur. You got me thinking about this, right? Because you said that, you know, people can go back and forth with emails, right? Citing information or making these certain claims or what have you, to no end, right? It doesn't matter how much evidence that you produce, they still come back, right? And I, and I say this, and, and Salika, you know, made me think of this as well because what we need to understand is that people oftentimes, when they engage in these types of conversations, right, these conversations function as motives of justification. Motives of justification. So in other words, if I can get you to agree with me, then this allows me to continue this type of behavior. In the current, right, it justifies my behavior from the past and allows me to continue to engage in this behavior in the future. So the conversation itself becomes very powerful, right? If, if you are induced into believing, right, the justification of that person's argument, which kind of goes back to what, what Salika was saying a little bit earlier, right? With some people, you would never appease. And in some cases, it is to your own detriment to try to appease, right? Vis-a-vis, -vis, right? Accepting these justifications of arguments through an email that you will never really agree to, right? Because it's just not your forward, right? You're just disinclined to believe that. And so for some, for some people, that is the ultimate goal. That is the yeah. ultimate goal. And if you make that concession, right, it justifies that behavior. You know, one way to handle that, too, to not justify that behavior, especially if they're doing the, I have um, 10 pages of YouTube videos and this is my evidence. They are centering themselves and saying, I am the one who decides who is, inter is evidence. So understand that they don't get to do that. You have every right to send an email saying, I'm not looking at this, 
because the evidence we're using is here. And this is the evidence that's come from the county, or the evidence has come from this, or the evidence has come from that. This is the evidence we're using. Because they don't get to center themselves and demand that you use evidence that you have not vetted, or to be honest, that is worthless. Now you can be aggressive with it or you can be nice with it, but you have to take your power back because this is an intimidation centering tactic. You have to do this, you have to convince me, you have to, no I don't, drop your end of the rope. Turn it back on him. So you've sent me all these YouTube videos. Why should I read this? We already have this evidence. Does this make sense? Because what they're doing is they're playing on your prejudice to harass you. They're playing on our cultural conditioning. Don't let them center themselves. And every one of these statements on here centers the speaker and puts you in a submissive posture. So start by questioning the legitimacy of them to make this comment. Does this make sense? And you don't have to be aggressive about it. Sometimes you do. I'm a tall black woman. There are some times where I'm just going to have to say, you don't get to do that. It's not your day today. I had a sheriff giving me hell, and he's like, you don't get to do this, da da da, da. I'm going to do this, da da da. It's like, dude, today I'm not a black woman, I'm a white woman, and you're going to listen to me. The whole room lost it, and I won the argument. Because I changed the rules of the way it was being seen. So if you can use the humor, use the humor, but don't let them define you. The woman called me a black radical. I looked at her cockeyed, and I said, do you mean this? And did the Wakanda thing? Is that radical? They're used to doing this to be able to manipulate you. This is all manipulation. So starting at the top, at first I really didn't like the first three, and I wanted to be sarcastic, but I came back to it and I found something, some way of not being sarcastic. So when somebody wanted me to teach them, I could say something like, well, my assumption is if you really wanted to learn something, you would be able to find material to read and read it, right? Or you learn best by doing. You would learn best by doing your own research. Because it depends on whether you want to be aggressive or not aggressive. If you want to be aggressive, it's, it's not my job to teach you. I do that all the time. If you want to be less aggressive, it's you learn best by doing your own. I can recommend some resources. Here's a book. Come back and talk to me when you've read it. I went to number 11. It says, uh, the question or their comment would have been, I don't think you're as marginalized as you claim. And my response was going to be, I'll talk about my experience as honestly as I can, and I'd like you to deal with it that way. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. You know, and another one would be, you don't get to judge that. I know my experience. You know your experience. You know, one would be, if you don't think I'm marginalized, are you actually talking to me in good faith? Would that make sense? Sure. For number 14, which was, uh, who wins the gold in oppression Olympics? At which point you're supposed to kick the guy in the balls. But, <laughs> but since we're nonviolent instead, we're non instead, my response would be 
no need to compete in being offensive or defensive, but I hope you can listen to and respect me. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Better or, than kicking them in the balls? Don't, don't kick okay. them in the balls. I mean, I know okay. lawyers, but we want to keep the bail money. Yes. You know, and, and, and another way to go with the Oppression Olympics one is that I didn't know this was a competition. I didn't realize you took it that way. Um, can we not all have different problems? Why does your problem have to be the center? So things like that. If you, so for the first one, um, I went a little more from the direction of um, trying to respond to the emotion instead of the words. Mm -hmm. um, so I wrote, let me see if I have this. You feel overwhelmed and unprepared, maybe? That could be it. That's one way to ask. Are you asking me to educate you because you feel overwhelmed? Are you asking me to educate you because you feel underprepared? OK, so I could be a little more direct about it. A little more direct, a little more precise. Okay. You know, why are you asking me to educate you? I'm tired, too. How about I give you these resources? You educate yourself. I think that's an honest way to do it. But if you're going to go in that direction, you do want to be fairly precise and not give them wiggle. OK. I, I think um, we have to be careful about offending people right off, because they may not understand that that is offensive to someone. And if you, if you respond in a snarly response, then they may be less likely to try to educate themselves about it. Um, I don't know. I think the whole, if you want to, the whole um, asking somebody about their experience, maybe they're trying to get a first, first person experience story about it, and they don't understand that some people might find that offensive. So I don't know. I, I think we should start out by giving them the benefit of the doubt and trying to steer them in, in a good direction and make it known how we feel about it, or, and then going from there. Well, there's a judgment call to be had here. It's, it's different for someone to say, Salika, I need to know what your experience was with the Eau Claire Area School District so that, or if you had bad experiences with it or good, so that we can change things. That would be good faith. Someone coming up to me and saying, and these literal words have been used, if you won't educate me, how can I learn? That's literally a bad faith argument. Demanding to be educated is very different than treating me with the respect of requesting to hear my experience. Because for some people, that request may be, I'm sorry, I can't talk about this, I'm not comfortable. Or it may be, I'm exhausted, I'm tired, and if I talk about this, it's going to make me upset. For others, it's going to be, sure, I'd love to talk to you about the fact that the school counselor took my kid out of Algebra 2 and put him in chip design, knowing that he wanted to be an engineer and he needed Algebra 2. So does that make sense? And this is part of how are they approaching you? Is this a good faith argument? Is this not a good faith argument? Because it got a question right there. Because sometimes if this is a this is a bad faith argument, this is part of exhausting the activist, especially exhausting the marginalized person. And we have a right to say, no, I really don't want to go through that. Um, okay, so I, somewhere between what Kate said and between what you're saying, there is this. Um, teach peace and love, <laughs> which is hard to do. So without being sometimes self-deprecating. So, you know, some of my answers, if someone said, you're not being a team player, I thought, well, let me say, 
oh, let's be on the team together. So my question is, is, you know, is that what you're talking about, giving them the benefit of the doubt and trying to reach out to them? Or is it uh, too self-deprecating? Am I, is that acquiescence? Is it, um, I don't know. I mean, we're supposed to have this, you know, come from a place of love too. So, yeah, that's a very good question. If I can kind of add to that. So part of the, the, the issue here is how are we using language within these situations? So think about this for a second. When we hear the term team player, right? specifically, you're not being a team player. I'm going to pose this question to you all. What does that mean for someone to say, you're not being a team player? and how we come to use terms culturally, right, that impute certain meanings that we take in. And I think that's part of what we have to, to understand, right? And I love the conversation that you guys are kind of engaging right now, because what, we, what constitutes a team player for Mark may be something entirely different for our sergeant. Mark. We get their value to be some cultural continuity and expression of team player. How much do you do in our own? Right? So we oftentimes don't unpack that. Those different meanings that we bring in the situational context, right? And then how we act upon those. So just another person or two, let me hear your thoughts on what does it mean for you to, to not be a team player? Not following the rules. Not following the rules, right? So if you, the team is already here, you're fine, right? If you're out, you're not going to sit with the same questions. They can come out with you, right? What else? You're making me uncomfortable. You're making me uncomfortable. Why? I mean, let me hear a little bit more about that. Right. So I'm not making that clear. So if you're making it, and if you're quite out of the time, right? Okay, so now you're putting me in an adversar adversarial space, right? And then when you think about being placed in an adversarial space, what does that do to us physiologically, which Salika was talking about a little bit earlier, and then what does it mean for how we engage in those situations in the future, right? Our actual actions that we partake, when we find ourselves in the next situation, we were called or called out to be, but not being a team player, right? So the goal here is how do we redefine, how do we reframe, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, these certain meanings, right, that have been used culturally, right? And how do we, how do we reframe them for ourselves individually and also within the modern context of culture, right? So when we do that, when we can actually think about how these words are being used, how they feel, right, and then think of a way of how we might reframe them, right, their utility for us as individuals. When we were talking about this, we were reflecting on what is the point of the conversation? because your response will be different. Um, if you're trying to end the conversation, you'll say, I'm not on your team. If you're trying to keep the conversation going, maybe you would say um, something like, are we on the same team? 
which then you're talking about, let's move them to the frontal lobes. So then you're having them start thinking and having to respond. And then maybe your conversation will keep going. So I think, I think it'd be different responses in different circumstances, depending on what you're intending to do. And just like the question um, uh, number four, but that happens to me too. Well, if you are going to respond the way you'd like them to respond to you, you might say, well, tell me about it. But then the question is, does that turn it over to them and then make the conversation all about them? And maybe you don't want to do that in that particular circumstance. I don't know. You know, there's always, it's always good to answer if you don't know what else to do with, so what does team player mean here? The other one, so that happens to you too. Does it happen exactly, it happened exactly the same way? Because it happens to you, then you can empathize with why it's such a problem because it happens so much to these people. Does it make sense? So the, the, there's a soft and there's a hard. Is this a good faith argument or is this not a good faith argument? And, and that's where you have to use your judgment. If you think this is a good faith argument, then you're pointing out it happens to you, so you should be able to empathize, but you know it happens to this group more. And we know it happens to this group more. So how do we stop it from happening to anybody? So there is a part of this that's letting go of your rope. You know, if they're saying it's happening to me too and they're willing to stop it, okay, we're not gonna get into this fight, let's move right to stopping it. But when you're dealing with someone like, um, you're being over emotional. I, I will admit that, uh, that my house is the house where Snark lives. And uh, I, I really have had to fight, and people on my Facebook page, you know, I always am praying for grace. I'm always pushing myself for grace. So, so here is where you can use tone to your advantage. There's a couple of ways to answer that. If someone tells me I'm being over emotional, really, please tell me how. Or if I think they're just, you know, it's a bad faith argument, really? And then you stop because silence drives people nuts. And they will feel it, and they will trip over their own selves. Who's more likely to hear that? So again, I'm getting back to cultural manifestations. <laughs> so, so again, I'm getting back to those cultural manifestations here, right? You're being overly emotional. Who's more likely to hear that, right? I'm very unlikely to be, to be told that, very unlikely. So that is not an argument that would be used with me or against me, right? So then it becomes, you know, how do, how do women or female or what have you, right? How do we reframe that? How do we think about that differently, right? So that's part of the work that we're trying to accomplish here. And part of what I want you guys to think about too, this language does not emerge from nowhere. It doesn't emerge from nowhere, right? In this culture, in America, it is predominantly hedonistic. And what I mean by that, we like to think, think in terms of good and pleasurable, comfort, discomfort, right? And then if, it, if it's outside of those norms, Right? Then it's an aberration. Right? And so think about that. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this when I kind of talk a little bit later, but I kind of see your hand waffling a little bit. Yeah. A lot of these deflection or derailing statements are personal statements, and I just see them as bait. You're overly emotional. You're intelligent. You're unintelligent. You're stupid. You're yes. diverting. And, and it's just like, it it's triggers, but if you see it as like, oh, it's personal, well, I'm, let's get back on topic, or don't even address, I mean, people are going to call me emotional, and they might even be right, but we're going to still keep talking about the topic. Well, it, they are bait, and they are meant to upset you and aggravate you, 
And that's why I want you to think about what your responses are so you can stay on topic. You know, and that's why sometimes with these, a good what question is the best thing. Um, and that also works with sexual harassment or racial harassment, especially with sexualized or racialized jokes. Um, if somebody, I'm trying to think of the one, my niece who works, she's a lawyer who works for the city of New York. And some man came up to her who she was supposed to help and said, you are the voice of a phone sex operator. Now this is a woman with a law degree. She teaches law at St. John's University. She's a full-time lawyer. But she and I have talked over these kind of things. And what she's, the technique she likes to use is, what did you mean by that? Oh, I was giving you a compliment. Why was that a compliment? The better question would be, how do you know that? Well, she wasn't going to go there. She didn't want to hear that. You know, that's, a man can ask that one. Seriously, though, think about the power of that question. How do you know that? Right? So, I like to, some, in, some, in certain situations, shifting to the why or the what, from the, away from the why or the what, to the how can be very powerful. So I endeavor to make people uncomfortable. And what I used to do in our relationship when I worked with 500 men, seven women, every comment that they would give to me, I would write it in the armor on my wall or door. Would there be? I've had people try to do the trolls and things like that. And it's like, oh, dude, dude. Oops. That's an F. You really failed there. That didn't work at all. I'm not insulted. I'm just sad for you. You know. But sometimes it's a question like, like and you said, ooh, so make a, make a violence, <laughs> make a fight. So, so, yeah, we're looking about something easy to get the people to make a fight, to make a, a violence. So that's why we can get some answers. It's easy, mm -hmm. and uh, we can get uh, any bad reply after that, because when you ask him, ask some people a question like he asked you, so he... You can... Sister, I can say you can a joke. <laughs> you can deflect. <laughs> You can deflect from most of these if you think that they're trying to get you off topic by saying, this is off topic. Or by saying the topic is, this is what we're talking about. Or how is this relevant? How is this relevant? This is not relevant. This is not helpful. Now, some of them may get aggressive at that point. So uh, those are the aggressive ones. The gentle ones are, we're not talking about that right now. We need to do this. We need to talk about this. Now, if I'm feeling really tired and I don't want to deal with the person, at that point, I give them something to do that's usually outside of the classroom. <laughs> I've done that with faculty and with people in the community too as well. Believe it or not, it works. It's the old teacher trick, the kid who was misbehaving, you had them slap erasers outside. 
you know, some of us remember erasers in the classroom. Some of us are too young to know erasers in the classroom. But if you have someone doing too many of these, you need to get them out of the space. And that's when you get creative about thinking, how am I getting them out of the space? But I also, because we're running out of time, <laughs> we're always 15 minutes past where I had wanted us to be, I'm going to come back to this after dinner, okay? Because we need to do Jim's role play. We need to do Jim's role play. So don't lose these, because we're gonna come back to this, because this is a lot of your real life, isn't it? How do we handle this? This is a lot of your real life.